Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to all for the Embassy Reads second quarter FY 2021 earnings conference call. Currently, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Our speakers will address your questions at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to introduce you to the host for today's conference, Mr. Ritwik Bhattacharji, Head of Capital Markets and Investor Relations for Embassy Reed. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Ray. Welcome to the second quarter FY 2021 earnings call for Embassy Reed, everyone. Embassy Reed released its financial results for the quarter and half year ending September 30th, 2020, a short while back. As is our standard practice, we have placed our quarterly financial statements, earnings presentation discussing our quarterly performance, and a supplemental financial and operating data book on our website at ir.embassyofficebox.com in the Investor Relations section. As always, we would like to inform you that management may make certain comments on this call that one could deem forward-looking statements. Please be advised that the REIT's actual results may differ from these statements. Embassy REIT does not guarantee these statements or results and is not obligated to update them at any time. Specifically, the financial guidance that we will provide on this call are management estimates and have not been subject to any audit, review, or examination procedures. We are cautioned not to place undue reliance on the guidance, and there can be no assurance that we will be able to achieve the same. Further, there are significant risks and uncertainties related to the scope, severity, and duration of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the actions taken to contain and mitigate the pandemic, and the direct and indirect economic effects of the pandemic and the containment measures on Embassy REIT and on our occupiers. First, a quick update. In September 2020, we were included in the FTSC ECRA NARIT Global Emerging Index, which is a prominent real estate benchmark for global investors. In addition, effective today, we have been included in the S&P Global Property Index and the S&P Global REIT Index. We believe that these inclusions will continue to enhance our trading liquidity, broaden our unit holder register, and deepen the pools of capital that can potentially invest in our REIT. Joining me on the call today are Mike Collin, the CEO, Vikash Kadloya, the Deputy CEO and COO, and Arvind Maya, a CFO. Mike will start off with the second quarter highlights, business overview and strategy, followed by Vikash and Arvind. We will then open the floor to questions. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Rithik. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the call today. We trust that you are all staying healthy and safe in these unprecedented times. Today, we announced our second quarter FY21 results. Notwithstanding the challenging external environment, we are pleased to again deliver on our quarterly distributions a healthy 4,244 million rupees for Q2, bringing our year-to-date unit holder distributions to 8,743 million, or 11.33 rupees per unit. Now, let me comment today on three key themes. First, on the pandemic. Throughout Q2, the period from July to September, India witnessed the phased lifting of government-mandated lockdown across states, although the number of COVID-19 cases continued to increase until a point in mid-September when the number of new cases and deaths started a steady decline on a pan-India aggregated basis. Today, it is very encouraging to note that three out of four of our markets, including Bangalore, are reporting this downward trend. State governments have shown that they are committed to a return to some level of normalcy of economic activity, and central government has released a set of new guidelines under its Unlock 5.0 plans effective October 1st to kickstart the economy with additional relaxations and fewer restrictions. And consequently, the slow but steady return to the workplace continues. However, while we see positive indicators in a number of areas, the pandemic retains the ability to surprise. Second, our occupiers and their industry. An area where clarity shines through in this time of uncertainty, feedback from our occupiers indicates that they are very positive about the future of their businesses in India and that they will continue to grow. 
technology companies and global captive centers applying technology-based solutions for their overseas businesses are the backbone of Embassy REIT. Our occupier base comprises 50% pure technology and 43% global captives. Multiple indicators, including public results, hiring statistics in India, industry analysis, business leader commentaries and conversations, all underscore the conclusion that these types of business have a very positive future. This is confirmed by NASCOM research, which projects that the Indian technology industry will grow at a CAGA of 13% to 350 billion US by 2025. For many of these businesses, India and the availability of talent at scale will continue to grow in significance for global delivery strategies in our increasingly digitized and technology dependent world. Third, the impact of work from home in India. After seven months of work from home debates, we are seeing an emerging positive consensus which reinforces our initial views. That the Indian working population demographics and the environments at home are very different from the West, with a high proportion of young people in the early phases of their career, that the desire for a collaborative space at the office to foster culture, learning and innovation is perhaps much greater in India as compared to the West. While we do expect work policies to incorporate more flexibility in the future, we believe that in the Indian market, the office will continue as the core business hub, perhaps much more so than in the West, providing high quality, lower density spaces with an increased focus on wellness features ultimately favoring institutional landlords like Embassy REIT. Compared to Q1, we see a gradual, slow, but consistent return to the workplace during the last few months. Interestingly, there are significant variations in approach between international and domestic companies. Many of the former are operating with less than 5% of their employees in the office, often due to their globally standardized protocols, while a number of large-scale domestic companies are operating with more than 30% of staff in the workplace. And so what does this mean for the office industry in India? In the short term, we have seen some modest progress on the return of leasing demand, with some consultants reporting a quarter-on-quarter -quarter increase of circa 8% in pan-India gross absorption. However, gross absorption is down 52% year-on-year for this quarter. They indicate full calendar year 2020 pan-India gross leasing in the range of 35 to 40 million square feet, down 20 to 25% against the last five-year average gross absorption. However, given the technology and GCT occupier base, the India structural story is intact. International property consultants expect demand to revive in 2021 with forecast office demand of circa 45 million square feet, 20% higher than calendar year 2020 and in line with the five-year average. While we have secured a number of leases totaling 210,000 square feet in Q2, which VCAS will update shortly, it is clear that the pause, assess, accelerate in decision-making for corporate leasing will move past the assessment stage once occupiers have substantively moved back to the offices. Our view is that demand will return strongly in a couple of quarters, given robust performances posted recently by technology and tech-dependent sectors which is the core occupier base for India office. Sector outlook in the medium term. On the supply front, the market supply forecast for the next two years has continued to decline since the beginning of this year. From 120 million square feet in January 2020 to 87 million square feet in September, implying a decline of 29% due to the continued pressures related to availability of labor, funding, and liquidity 
we may see further shrinkage in this number by the end of the year. Our assessment of the actual comparable and competing supply for embassy REITs is even lower. With limited upcoming supply, already low vacancy rates in our key markets, and further de-densification plans by corporates, we expect rentals to hold firm in our core markets of Bangalore and Pune. The recent results announcements from many technology companies have outlined the strong pipeline of deals, significant pull forward in expenditure on digital transformation and cloud migration, and an uptick in hiring by these corporates. Some corporates have indicated that COVID-19 has essentially halved the timeline for digital transformation, bringing it forward by at least five years. We also expect increased offshoring to global captives as well as third-party service providers in a recessionary and geographically agnostic world, the aftershock bounce back driving office demand as India experienced post the GFC. Looking to the longer term, we noted the detailed global research report from Cushman and Wakefield, which projects 700 million square feet of office demand to 2030 in APAC, excluding China, with 60% being driven by India, and the methodology and conclusions of that report underscore the continuation of the growth of the India office sector over the next decade, as often articulated to us by many of our occupiers. The significant skills and cost advantage that India offers, both in terms of workforce as well as real estate costs, will continue to drive global occupiers to India office. On potential acquisitions, we are evaluating the Embassy Tech Village ROFO opportunity and are monitoring external market conditions. Other acquisition opportunities in the market which match our previously articulated acquisitions criteria are also being examined. We will update at the appropriate time. I will now hand over to Vikash to discuss in detail our business and operating performance for Spring 2. Thanks, Mani. Good evening, everybody. Further to the operational update for Q2 that we provided a month back, business highlights for this quarter include continued support to our occupiers as they repopulate the offices, including launch of Office Again campaign and recent health and safety certifications. New leases and renewals signed for Q2 stood at 210k square feet across seven deals, including 124,000 square feet of new leases at 10% above market rents and 86,000 square feet renewals at 7% spreads to existing rents. Portfolio occupancy at 91.7% on a 26.2 million square feet operating portfolio with same store occupancy of 93.4% and the acquisition of property maintenance operations for 20.3 million square feet existing REIT properties for rupees 4.74 billion to further enhance service delivery to occupiers. Let me take you through the details. First, an update on our operations and COVID-19 response. We remain closely engaged with our occupiers to facilitate employee safety and business continuity. All our properties across India remained open and operational throughout the quarter. We continue to see a gradual, slow but consistent ramp up in the number of occupiers repopulating our buildings. Over 95% of our occupiers and a weekday average of over 16,600 employees operated from our properties in October compared to a weekday average of 8,500 employees operating from our properties during Q1. Safety of employees working from our properties remain our highest priority. We continue to keep our buildings safe and secure with international standard health and sanitization procedures and technology-driven solutions. Additionally, during the quarter, we received health, safety, and ESG assurance certifications from globally renowned institutions such as the British Safety Council and British Standard Institution, endorsing the quality and effectiveness of the wellness practices adopted by us and our efforts in controlling the spread of COVID-19 across our pan-India office portfolio. 
We continue to support our occupiers in their return to workplace efforts. We launched the Office Again campaign to engage and update occupiers and their employees on various health and safety initiatives and build confidence as they repopulate their workspaces. Employee feedback and response to our campaign has been very positive as they look forward to returning to workplace. Above initiatives combined with the quality of our occupier base and proactive engagement by our on-ground teams contributed to continuing strong rental collections from our occupier. As of date, we have collected 99.5% of our Q2 rentals and 99.7% of our Q1 rentals from office occupiers. Moving to our leasing and lease management initiatives. During Q2, we maintained a healthy portfolio occupancy of 91.7% on our 26.2 million square feet operating portfolio, with same store occupancy at 93.4%. The portfolio occupancy declined marginally by 50 basis points compared to Q1, but was in line with expansion in vacancy rate across our key markets. Of our 7.1 million square feet leases due for escalations during the course of FY2021, we achieved 11% rental increases on 1.9 million square feet across 18 office leases during Q2 delivering the year-to-date rental increases of 12% on 3.7 million square feet across 40 office leases. We remain confident to achieve 13% rental increase on the remaining 3.4 million square feet leases due for revision during the remainder of this financial year, given that these leases are already 30% below market. Our healthy occupancy, robust collections, and successful rental increases, therefore, form the base of our NOI and distributions. As expected, the leasing activity remained muted this quarter. Despite this, we signed a total of seven leases, totaling 210,000 square feet during the quarter, comprising both new leases and renewal of ultimate expiries. This includes three new leases, totaling 124,000 square feet area, concluded at 10% above market rents to corporates from technology, telecom, and manufacturing sectors, and renewal of four ultimate lease expiries totaling 86,000 square feet at 7% renewal spread to existing rents. Given the travel restrictions, we also launched virtual property tours of our buildings to facilitate inspections by our existing and prospective occupiers and are seeing early signs of pickup in deal activity with a current pipeline of 265,000 square feet. Moving to expiries. Of the 1.9 million square feet due for expiry in FY 2021, we have successfully backfilled or renewed 529,000 square feet or 28% of expiries at 13% mark-to-market spread on a year-to-date basis. Of this, 129,000 square feet was backfilled or renewed during Q2 at 6% mark-to-market spread. An additional 148,000 square feet or 10% of expiries are likely renewals and discussions remain on track. As discussed during our previous call, the remaining 1.2 million square feet expiries, contributing to 5.6% of our annualized rents, are likely exist during the course of this financial year. Of this, 0.4 million square feet relates to occupiers facing COVID-19 headwinds and cost pressures and the balance 0.8 million square feet is part of normal occupier churn. These include instances of occupiers relocating to a different micro market, consolidating to self-owned or another property, rebalancing existing portfolios, and undertaking portfolio housekeeping. Though we have backfilled approximately 1 million square feet annually over the last four years, the backfill of likely exists in FY 2021 totaling 1.2 million square feet may take some time given the overall pause in decision-making. While corporates remain cautious and continue to delay major leasing decisions, we are seeing early signs of recovery and pickup in deal activity with resumption of new lease inquiries and multiple large RSPs in the market. As Mike mentioned earlier, we are seeing strong performances and hiding ramp up by technology companies and global captives who continue, be, who continue to be the primary absorption drivers for in their office. More importantly, as corporates continue to bring back employees to workplaces and ramp up numbers, the need for additional space to take into account social distancing 
and wellness norms will prompt leasing activity to considerably pick up. Our most recent discussions with both large occupiers as well as property consultants have revolved around large occupiers taking a long-term view on their space needs given low existing supply, especially in our core markets of Bangalore and Pune. We remain confident of the medium-term demand prospects and the ability and strength of our portfolio to deliver on the same. Our on-campus development projects have witnessed steady ramp up. During the quarter, construction continued across our 2.7 million square feet ongoing on-campus development projects with steady increase in site activity. With all appropriate health and safety precautions at work sites, the labor ramp up has been encouraging at 85% of peak COVID peak capacity. Given these development projects are due for delivery beginning June 2022, we are confident of meeting those timelines considering our liquidity and financing availability. Also, our occupiers continued their fit out works on 820,000 square feet corresponding to the 60% pre-committed spaces in the new buildings delivered at Embassy Manyata NXT and Embassy Oxygen earlier this year. Occupiers for 245,000 square feet have already commenced business operations from these new premises and the rest plan to go live around the end of this financial year. Our ability to finance on-campus development projects cover time delays due to unanticipated events such as recent lockdowns and our flexibility to control supply timing of our projects places us in a preferred position given the overall supply slippages in the market and the expectation by property consultants of supply recovery significantly lagging demand recovery. Finally, I will cover our asset management updates. First, an update on our hotel portfolio. Both our hotels were operational during the quarter but continue to witness single-digit occupancy due to the travel slowdown. Hospitality demand is expected to remain muted for the remainder of the financial year. Our hospitality team remains focused on conserving cash and has minimized the Q2 cash burn to rupees 94 million. The, the impact of the hospitality slowdown is expected to be limited on our portfolio given these hotels contribute less than 5% of our gross asset value and less than 1% of our pre-COVID NOI. We continued with our asset and infrastructure upgrade initiatives during Q2. Regular investment in our properties through select infrastructure and upgrade projects is core to our asset management philosophy. Our comprehensive infrastructure program at Embassy Manyata comprising construction of a new flyover, development of 619 key dual branded Hilton hotels, and master plan upgrade initiatives continued at pace and are on track. Additionally, the comprehensive repositioning initiative launched last quarter for Embassy Quadron property in Pune is progressing well. To further strengthen our property management delivery, we recently announced the acquisition of property management operations relating to two of our largest assets, Embassy Manyata and Embassy Tech Zone, totaling 20.3 million square feet. This acquisition is from an embassy sponsor affiliate and the consideration of Rs. 4,740 million is at an 8.5% discount to average of two independent valuation reports. This acquisition was funded through the 6.7% coupon bearing debt raised recently and is expected to be 2.3% NOI accretive and 0.5% DPU accretive on a performer basis. This acquisition further enhances our overall operational delivery capability and helps us respond with more agility to our occupiers' operational needs and address their safety concerns. With this acquisition, we will own property management service delivery of all our fully owned properties. As you can see, during this quarter, we continue to focus on active asset management and operational excellence to navigate and support the real estate needs of our occupiers through the pandemic. We recognize the increasing importance of wellness features and flexibility options in the future leading decisions of our occupiers and continue to work with them to structure mutually beneficial solutions. We are confident that once the pandemic subsides, and it will subside eventually, and once decision-making and leasing activity are back on track, high-quality, grade-A office portfolio like ours will see greater demand 
and will result in significant market share gain for our properties. Over to Arvind now for the financial updates. Thanks, Vikash. Good evening, everybody. Despite the external challenges brought by the continuing pandemic, we delivered another quarter of resilient financial performance. Financial highlights for Q2 include net operating income of Rs. 4,814 million for the quarter, up 10% year-on-year, with NOI margin of 89%, up 500 basis points. Distributions of Rs. 4,244 million, or Rs. 5.5 per unit for the quarter, representing a 100% payout ratio. Successful raise of Rs. 7.5 billion listed debentures at a competitive 7.25% quarterly coupon. And robust balance sheet with low leverage of 16% and strong liquidity position of Rs. 12.2 billion. Now let me take you through the details. Revenue from operations for Q2 grew by 4% year over year to Rs. 5,401 million, mainly on account of contracted lease escalations and income from new leases in our recently delivered buildings at Embassy Maneta and Oxygen, partially offset by decrease in hotel revenues due to COVID impact. Net operating income for Q2 grew by 10% year over year to Rs. 4,814 million and cumulatively for H1 by 5% year over year to Rs. 9,383 million. Our same store NOI for Q2 grew by 6% year over year and cumulatively for H1 by 3%. Continuing the trend of last quarter, our NOI margins improved year over year by 500 basis points to an impressive 89%, mainly reflecting the change in segment mix with a higher margin commercial office segment contributing to a greater proportion of the NOI, as well as cost savings achieved during the quarter. EBITDA for Q2 grew by 13% year over year to Rs. 4,730 million and cumulatively for H1 by 8% year over year to Rs. 9,237 million. Our EBITDA margins improved by 700 basis points to 88%, led by our cost savings initiatives, as well as interest income received on purchase consideration advance for MSC Maneta M3 Block B transaction. Our net distributable cash flow for the quarter stood at Rs. 4,229 million, and the board of directors of the manager to the embassy REIT in their meeting held earlier today, declared Q2 FI21 distributions of Rs. 5.50 per unit, representing a payout ratio of 100%. This distributions of Rs. 5.5 per unit comprise of Rs. 1.9 per unit towards interest receipts from SPV, Rs. 3.18 per unit towards amortization of SPV level debt, and Rs. 0.42 per unit of dividends. With this, Embassy REIT has now cumulatively declared YTD distributions totaling Rs. 8,743 million or Rs. 11.33 per unit for the first half of FI21. The record date for the Q2 distributions is November 10, 2020, and the distributions will be paid on or before November 17, 2020. Next, an update on our balance sheet. We continue to maintain a conservative balance sheet with a low leverage of 16% net debt to total enterprise value, with less than 1% of total debt maturing prior to FI22. Further, we continued our strong liquidity position with Rs. 12.2 billion of liquidity as of September 2020, comprising of 9 billion of cash and treasury balances and Rs. 3.2 billion in undrawn commitments. <coughs> During the quarter, we announced the successful placement of Rs. 7.5 billion Crystal AAA stable rated listed debentures with a 37-month maturity at an attractive 7.25% coupon payable quarterly. The debt raise witnessed healthy demand and was anchored by a prominent domestic financial institution demonstrating the preference for high-quality borrowers like us in the current volatile markets. We utilized majority of this raise to refinance Rs. 6,752 million of our existing debt at 140 basis points lower coupon rate. Post the quarter end, we successfully raised another tranche of listed debentures totaling Rs. 7.5 billion at an impressive 6.7% coupon payable quarterly. <coughs> this transaction witnessed healthy demand and was well received by several prominent domestic financial institutions. 
we utilized rupees 4740 million of this raise to fund a purchase of property management operations for two of existing REIT properties which Vikas outlined earlier. Our ability to raise debt at competitive rates once again de demonstrates the strength of our balance sheet and the flight to quality borrowers given the current market situation. Even post this debt raise, we have over rupees 110 billion or 1.5 billion dollars of additional debt headroom and are well placed to finance accretive growth acquisitions to the benefit of our unit holders. Moving to other financial updates. Our rental collections from office occupiers remain strong at 99.5% in Q2, in line with robust office rental collections of 99.7% for Q1. While we have not granted any rental waivers to our office occupiers, we have provided rental rebates totaling 1.4% of our annual rents to support our food court, ancillary retail, and small business tenants through the pandemic. We continued our cost savings program initiated last quarter, targeting savings across our operating, hospitality, and corporate overhead costs. To date, we have been able to achieve cost savings of rupees 585 million, resulting in significant operating margin improvements. Our independent valuers undertook fair valuation exercise of our properties for the half year in the September 20 and assessed the gross asset value of the portfolio at rupees 337 billion, up 2% from GAV as of 31st March 2020 with our core commercial office segment driving over 92% of REIT value. A net asset value as of September 30, 2020 stood at rupees 289 billion or rupees 375.02 per unit in line with our NAV per unit estimate as of 31st March 2020. As updated during our previous call, in Q1, we filed the scheme of arrangement to collapse the legacy two-tire holding structure of Embassy Monetary Entity and we expect to receive regulatory approvals for March 2021. Upon simplifying our holding structure, the proportion of our dividends to our overall distribution is likely to increase to over 60%, comparing favorably to 7% for H1. We anticipate that our dividend and SPV level debt amortization components taken together will represent over 75% of our distributions post March 2021. This will be a positive given REIT dividend is fully tax-free for investors and will further enhance the overall post-tax distribution yield, especially for domestic institutional and retail investors. Lastly, I will update on the outlook for the remainder of FI2021. Given we are already halfway through FI21, we now have reasonable visibility on the trends emerging for the remainder of the year. In terms of guidance for the full year, FI21, we expect NOI to be in the range of rupees 18,530 to rupees 19,480 million with a midpoint of rupees 19,005 million <clears throat> and expect distributions per unit to be in the range of rupees 21.49 to rupees 22.59 per unit with a midpoint of rupees 22.04 per unit. Note that these estimates have been arrived taking into account the following key assumptions and are subject to there being no further major lockdowns or other unforeseen circumstances given the evolving nature of the pandemic. <clears throat> a rent yield in commercial office portfolio based on over 160 credit worthy occupiers continue to be resilient with 99.6% rental collection for the first half of FI21. We expect similar rental collection trends going forward and our NOI margins for the commercial office segment are assumed to remain at similar levels as first half of FI21. We achieved YTD rental increases of 12% on 3.7 million square feet across 40 leases, office leases, and assumed similar rental increases of 13% on 3.4 million square feet upcoming rental escalations for the remainder of the year. Our existing vacancy of 2.2 million square feet along with the upcoming likely exits of 1.2 million square feet will take some time to be backfilled due to the boss assess accelerate decision making framework adopted by occupiers which Mike referred to earlier. While we continue to remain very positive on return of demand in medium term, especially for institutional landlords like ourselves, in the short term this may impact our existing 91.7% occupancy levels and hence our revenues for the balance of FI21. Our two operational hotels are expected to see muted demand 
and occupancy levels for the remainder of FY21, and we expect a quarterly cash burn of rupees 90 to 100 million till such time travel and hotel demand revives. We remain focused on delivering our NOI and quarterly distributions and maintaining our liquidity and balance sheet discipline. Over to Mike for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Arvind. So we continued our resilient performance this quarter with strong rental collections and again underline our commitment to quarterly distributions to our unit holders with the 4,244 million rupee distribution in Q2. Our second quarter unfolded as expected. Corporates continue to defer decision making in the volatile and uncertain macro environment and this translated to slower leasing in commercial office space and an overall marginal increase in vacancy rates for the Indian market as also reflected in a slight decline in our occupancy. The integration of property management operations for two of our largest properties through the acquisition as detailed by Vikash earlier will further strengthen operational relationships with our occupiers and enhance service delivery especially important given the heightened health and safety focus by occupiers as they finalize back to workplace strategies. We're positive for the next financial year due to our portfolio exposure to the right markets and the right sectors. The customers we primarily cater to are doing well and we are confident that this will drive demand once decision making returns next year. We are extremely well positioned to emerge stronger as the market moves towards fewer quality institutional landlords like Embassy REIT. And in the meantime, we remain committed to our business strategy to deliver total return to our unit holders through regular quarterly distributions supplemented by our organic and inorganic growth initiatives. So that was the business overview for Q2 FY21. Let's move to Q&A, please. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask questions may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Abhishek Bhandari from Macquarie Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening to everyone. Uh, Arvind, I have a question for you. So, you know, in this quarter, we did uh, get some interest cost saving because of refinancing. Uh, do you think we have further scope to reduce our borrowing costs, especially for the, you know, Red TV which is coming up for repayment in 23? Is there any repayment clause what you can take benefit of to reduce the cost? Hey, thanks, uh, Vishay, for the question. So, uh, yes, you're right. There's been significant reduction in our interest costs, um, and that's been evidenced in the two bond raises which we've done. And uh, just kind of linking it up to our cons uh, current existing NCD, which is our 3650 crores of uh, bond, this Abhishek comes up for ultimate maturity in June 22 with a prepayment option from December 21 onwards. Uh, so at that point in time, we'll evaluate uh, the refinancing of this NCD uh, and the proportion which we will refinance into a coupon bearing debt, uh, which is the proportion of under construction buildings which are completed. So at that point in time, we'll reevaluate, and if the current market continues, we expect that, uh, you know, this compression in rates, uh, we will be able to take advantage of, and it will be great for our business at that time. Sure. Thanks, Arvind. Uh, Vikash, my second question is to you. You know, you mentioned that uh, you achieved 13% mark-to-market, you know, kind of spread on the releasing. Um, but if I look at, you know, compared to the, previous year's numbers when we should talk about 19-20% spread on those numbers. Uh, do you think the current uh, MPM are running slightly lower below our original estimates? Thanks, Abhishek. Uh, that's a great question. So, uh, I'll break it into two pieces. One, on the new leases, if you see 
as you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the 120 or 1,000 square feet that we've done, that will yield it actually 10% above market rents. On the MTM, uh, one, the momentum has been slow, we laid down the reason. So what we are seeing is that, uh, you know, the MTM realizations have been flattish. What I mean by that is while it is in line with uh, what the market rents are and what we have achieved in the past, but we've not been able to, uh, you know, really drive those MPMs higher as, you know, usually we would do uh, each year. So I think 13% uh, reducing spreads on the 0.5 million we've already done is uh, partly reflective of the in-place rent of those leases, uh, you know, when they came up for expiry. If you, if I can just kind of guide you to slide 31 of our earnings debt, uh, the 1.2 million square feet which we are we are uh, projecting as likely exists, the NPM on that is actually 16%. So it, 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 it's a mix of both. One, of course, we would love to achieve even higher NPMs, but these are in line with our expectations. And two, the remaining leases which are likely exist are actually at much below market rents. And whenever we do lease them up, we'll see higher NPMs. Does, does that help, Abhishek? Yes, yes. Thanks, 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 Vikas. And uh, Mike, my last question is to you. Uh, you know, given the current market conditions and the abundant liquidity available in the capital markets, uh, do you think it makes sense to probably accelerate our, you know, evaluation of EDV? Yeah, so, um, you know, on, on acquisitions generally, we are, you know, we are looking at a number of uh, different opportunities. We continue to evaluate uh, Embassy Tech Village. Um, we'll come back on those opportunities in due course. I think as a general comment, we do see a divergence generally across the market where the really high quality properties um, are in strong demand from a number of potential uh, acquirers. Um, and a falling away of the second grade type of property. So we will continue to focus around the quality type of property. We outlined the criteria for that before. Um, and yes, um, we, 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 will, we will continue uh, to, to do that, to look at that, and to do all the work around uh, different opportunities, including tech business. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Saurabh Kumar from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, so I have three questions. One is on this dividend, uh, which is down. Uh, I just want to understand below the line uh, what is happening uh, at golf, uh, at golf links. And any other below the line adjustments which uh, may have happened to track down this dividend? Because if I look at your property level in DCF, that is still up 4%. The drag is coming below that, and I just want to get a better handle of that. And also, Arvind, related uh, is essentially if you can just explain why the working capital has moved, the weight has moved. So that's first, and I'll follow up with the other two later. So, Arvind, you can, you can take that? Yeah. Sarab, hi, good evening. So, uh, just taking the questions one by one. So if, if you just go through the distributions number uh, or the walkthrough, uh, you will see that the distributions uh, Q1, Q are down 8%, even though the NOI is up. So I would say there are two main reasons for that. Uh, one is in one is the point which you mentioned around golf link, the joint venture entity. The distributions are lower because the debt was fully repaid in the beginning of this quarter. So now the cash flows are distributed to both shareholders by way of dividends. In relation, the second item which kind of moves the distributions lower during the quarter is because of the working capital changes. Now, this is largely due to the secondary deposit refunds during the current quarter uh, due to the occupier churn which Vikas mentioned. So, these are the two main reasons uh, which are which are the numbers or items which are impacting our flow through uh, of uh, EBITDA to NDCF. Okay, and this uh, embassy golf links, this 26 odd crores, uh, that is your profit plus depreciation at golf links. Is that a fair number? I mean, on a quarterly basis. Is that uh, sorry, uh, can you just repeat that? So 
So this 26 crores we are seeing in Embassy Golf Links, uh, mm-hmm. uh, that is the now the stable level of cash flow which one should expect as distribution uh, from. Uh, uh, sir, not really. So this number, what you're seeing, 23 crores, was the final installment of debt, which was repaid okay. during the quarter. And in future quarters, assuming there is no further debt, this number will move to zero. What will happen in subsequent quarters is that Golflings will distribute dividends, and these okay. dividends will be received in the entity Embassy Office Park Private Limited. This is the tech zone entity. And no, if you just look no. at the mm. walk down, it will sit as a part of other income. Yeah, but I just want to know what is that amount which it will get distributed. So what I'm trying to get is what is the profit plus depreciation of golf links and just to see what is the offset against this 23 crores which, I, which we get. Yeah, so sort of the run rate uh, going forward uh, in a current basis will be approximately about 30 crores of dividend per quarter. Okay, so 26 crores goes away, 30 comes back. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Okay, the second is uh, uh, on this, uh, just following up on this mark-to-market question, so you have, uh, you know, in fiscal 22 and 23, uh, significant mark-to-market, uh, which you, I think, uh, show on your slide 31. So in the current market, uh, you know, and as you roll into F22, I'm sure you are having some of these forward-looking conversations with your tenant. How confident are you to achieve, uh, maybe not the exact number, but something uh, uh, around that vicinity? Because that will be a pretty significant driver of your NOI growth, I guess, in fiscal 22 and 23. Hey, so thanks for this question, Vikash. Here, that's a that's a good question. So, couple of things. One, uh, the FY 22 and 23 mark to market, which uh, you see on page 31, which is approximately 58% and 37% respectively. One, that's a function and factor of what are the in place rent. So, some of our legacy uh, 15 year yeah. leases. Some of our, you know, large occupiers come up for renewal ultimate ultimate expiry at that point in time. So, for instance, just to just to yeah. just in, for example, a monitor rent, uh, you know, uh, monitor rent for a legacy lease would be let's say uh, 40, 50 percent of the existing rent that we are able to achieve. So, in that sense, we remain fairly confident uh, and positive on achieving those mark to market uh, gains. Uh, yes, uh, we also note that by that point in time, we expect the leasing momentum to pick up in the market. In fact, if you see current quarter, uh, some of the leases that we have done, the 124,000 square feet, has actually been 10% above market rents, you know, as rents which are assessed by CBRE. And this also follows the market rents assessed independently by CBRE and how, how much is the mark to market. So we remain fairly positive. We we have delivered those in the past. These are legacy leases significantly below market. We think we'll be able to achieve these mark to market gains. Okay, got it. And uh, the third question is generally on the market, uh, you know, so we are seeing, uh, you are obviously uh, painting a, uh, a, a, a maybe a more realistic outlook. But generally, when you see the papers, you keep hearing about all these record deals happening, you know, every two, three weeks in India. So I just want to know whether uh, are you seeing uh, uh, from 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 all these occupiers that, I mean, so effectively, we are seeing uh, some of these guys continue to invest and continue to take about these one, one and a half million square feet assets. Uh, is there, uh, are you losing out there just because you don't have supply in the relevant market or you don't have too much, any capacity? Is that why we are not there or is it they are, I mean, the market is just bad and there's nothing to be done there. I mean, and this is just bad news. I mean, the news is irrelevant. So, uh, thanks for, thanks for that, Saurav. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there's some great deals that have been announced over the last six months during the, um, the COVID uh, period, the, 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 the FANG type of companies, um, and, and in multiple cities. So that, you know, that's, that's great news. Um, and it's an indicator, I think, of the strength of the technology sector and the way in which, um, they, uh, they, they continue to grow and continue to see, uh, India as the place that they can support their global businesses. I think we do have limited uh, supply ourselves, our occupancy is, is up there at that 91%. Um, 
Um, the, the supply that we did bring forward at the end of last year, uh, particularly in Bangalore, you know that we're 70 odd percent uh, occupied on that. And that's just a, a really positive reflection of particularly the Bangalore market. You know that parts of parts of Bangalore, even though uh, vacancies might have gone on by uh, one or two percent over the last six months, actually CBRE are reporting increases in rentals even over the last quarter. So um, it's a strong market. Uh, would we like to have more supply available to lease up now? Yes. Um, we believe that once decision making comes back, um, the limited quantum of space that we have today uh, will be taken up uh, pretty pretty quickly. And then the new space that we've got under construction in Pune uh, and in Bangalore, which of course is not coming on through for uh, another couple of years, uh, we, we, we think that we'll, uh, we'll be talking to those types of large tenants who've got RFPs out in the market now. So, um, very positive. Okay. And just uh, one last question with your permission. I mean, just in terms of the distribution, so uh, is there any thought to move away from, you know, uh, distributing the entire free cash to doing something which like the global lease too, which is just the FFO? which is maybe a profit plus depreciation uh, and the straight lining impact. I mean, so as to reduce the volatility around working capital and all the other changes. Uh, or would you continue on this? Sort of, so uh, our thought process and philosophy on distribution is to continue 100% of our NDCF as distributions. And that is largely supported by, I would say, three reasons. One is the existing liquidity in the business of $9 billion as well as the undrawn commitment. Second is a leverage, low leverage ratio of 16% and our ability to raise additional funding as even required, especially for our CapEx projects. And lastly, I would say the strong 99.6% collections which are coming from our office occupiers, all put together gives us the confidence to continue to distribute 100%. And sort of high, just to add here, while you, know, your point, you make a point on uh, make, uh, ensuring that distributions are more even. But, you know, the way we look at it is we, we manage the business for uh, not for the quarter but a longer horizon. And, you know, we would kind of encourage, uh, you know, encourage the analyst investor community to look at it more from, uh, you know, uh, distributions for a particular year or a longer time frame. So in, in that sense, you know, the you know couple of cycles in the business will get taken care of itself in terms of tenants exiting, new tenants coming in, and the revenues and the distributions reflecting that. Okay. Fair point. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Lakhan from CLSA. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, my first question was on the key assumptions that we have uh, for the H2 guidance for the distribution. So I understand the golf links dividends may offset the the principal repayment, uh, but just want to understand the working capital changes, right? Um, considering that the, we expect 1.2 million square feet of likely exit, how are we based on those assumptions for H2? Yeah, Kunal. So uh, you're absolutely right in terms of the guidance what we've given for the full year FI21 where we have uh, given a midpoint number of 22.04 per unit, factors in, I think, two key reasons why the distribution from EBITDA to NDCF goes down. One is the golf link point, which I spoke about. Second, working capital uh, has two components, a large component pertaining to the security deposit refunds, uh, which are expected over the next six months, which have been factored in. And as we did uh, mention in our last quarter call, there were a few one-off items which were there in the working capital of last year, which is not expected to recur. That's also been factored in. Sure, sure, that's that's helpful. Also, just uh, just to follow up on the uh, on the question on on the distribution. So uh, the tech zone distribution this quarter was uh, not down YOY by almost 260 million. Uh, what's the reason for that? Sorry, can you just repeat the question again? The tech zone distribution so was? The NDCF from tech zone was down by uh, 260 million YOY. Um, so uh, this is basically comparing it to June 19 quarter, right? Correct, correct, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so we, we had mentioned this in our uh, last year call that in June 19, there was one pre-termination from a large tenant which earned us the pre-termination fees, which was part of distributions for June 19 quarter. Uh, you know, that that is primarily the reason why you see this number uh, going down. Sure, sure. Thanks. And uh, this, secondly, in the opening remarks, uh, Mike, you mentioned that uh, you are you continue to evaluate opportunities besides Tech Village. Uh, can you give us uh, some indication on how is the acquisition scenario right now, considering the deals that have happened so far, the, be it the RNG announcement or be it the the, uh, the the deal that's going on between Blackstone and Prestige? So how are you looking at the acquisition scenario currently? I mean, I think we've, we've set out the criteria that we're, we're looking for in potential acquisitions. We've, we've kind of set out the geographies that we'd look at, the, the customer base, the sector, um, which is office, um, the scale. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we would have a particular return profile. We're, we're not focused primarily on uh, development. We're not focused on retail. Um, so if you look at some of the portfolios that you've mentioned, um, they'd be very different in, in a number of the types of criteria. So, you, so our core focus is office, large scale, um, very similar tenant profile to, uh, to what we currently have within the portfolio because we feel that that is you know, the, the best profile of tenants, the highest credit quality, and the most resilient, as actually we've seen in the last six months. Um, you know, we were often asked about technology and concentration around technology, and I think it, it's, it's been underscored that actually now the world is becoming more tech, uh, technologically dependent and therefore more dependent on our sort of tenants. So I think we, we will continue to focus on a similar profile um, if we're looking at acquisitions as, as we've previously articulated. Also, Kunal, just to add, uh, you know, we believe that institutions with access to capital will really be able to differentiate themselves and kind of access some of these large opportunities as distress and liquidity concerns play out in the market. And the teams who have the ability to move fast and underwrite uh, based on the on-ground experience will really be able to benefit from this. So we think we are well-placed in that regard. So, Vikas, just a related question on that. Like you mentioned, access to capital. So, would you still look at uh, raising equity for any such acquisition, you know, considering considering the cost of borrowing now that you're getting is closer to the yields? Yeah, hey, Kanal, it's terrific. Let me just jump in here. I think uh, the, the short answer to that is if uh, the, the use of proceeds and, and the acquisition makes sense and it's a large capital raise, we would absolutely think about raising equity. It's in line with what REITs globally do. I think they are financing vehicles. And I think the one thing that you do have to remember is that, you know, while we do have access to debt capital, and I think the, the finance, Arvind and the team have done a fantastic job raising capital in, in these times, uh, the capacity for raising leverage right now is pretty constrained for a REIT, simply because of the regulatory requirement and the fact that the matters that the capital sort of structure environment for REITs is changing. So one thing we don't want to do is, uh, you know, overextend ourselves on leverage. And I think if there is the opportunity to use um, equity and units to raise capital, we will. It, it clearly is something that I think, you know, liquidity is um, something in short supply for, for the REIT right now. We are focused on that. That's feedback we get from the buy side as well. And for a defined use of course, we can certainly think about it, yes. Sure. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you. Before we take the next question, we'd like to inform participants that in order that the management is able to address questions from all participants in the conference, please limit your questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we request you to rejoin the queue. We take the next question from the line of Murtuza Arfiwala from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, gentlemen. Uh, just on the revised guidance on NOI, uh, you know, can you just break it down into broader buckets in terms of, you know, how much of the of the guidance was revised downwards because of hotels shutting down, how much would be broadly because of, you know, exits, 
And have we seen any contractual escalations not being met or any unexpected sort of impact of COVID besides, you know, the obvious? Uh, you know, just some broader sort of classification of uh, how the uh, downward division happened. And second is, do you see, uh, you know, the, the extent of impact continuing on FY22 while we did not have a formal guidance, but in terms of, you know, the collateral sort of damage on FY22 earnings, maybe hotels sort of uh, continue to operate at low occupancy and other such sort of impacts. So if you could just give a broad classification on how you see that guidance, you know, just to get a sense of how much you'll have an ongoing impact of that. So, uh, in relation to uh, the split of the NOI guidance, uh, yeah. you know, if, if you were to look at it between hospitality and uh, the commercial business, I would say uh, the hospitality business, as you as you look at the first two quarters, has led to a, a cash burn of approximately 200 million, and that is the expected level for the next two quarters as well. So, overall, it's expected to be negative by 400 million. For the full year, uh, vessels, uh, it was, uh, uh, I don't exactly remember what it was, about 100 to 200 million positive last year. So that's the impact of hospitality. And if you look at it from a commercial perspective, uh, I would say there are positives and negatives. Uh, from a positive perspective, the new lease up which has happened in the newly completed towers, which is NXT and T2, uh, is a positive from an NOI perspective. But having said that, some of this will not really flow through the distribution for the year because of the rent-free period for without mm -hmm. completion. But it does yeah. add to the NOI, uh, some of which gets offset uh, by the you know exits, which Vikash mentioned. Uh, while the exits will not have full impact uh, for the year because the exits are happening during the course of the year, but yes, it does have uh, impact because that will are going to take time. Sure. Uh, just in terms of um, the subsequent part of the question on FI22, Mutsada, uh, I would say that we would want to reassess the position on this in April 22 and provide an update uh, based on the overall economic stability at that point in time. Sure. Thank you. Mutsada, you, you did ask also about contractual escalations being met, and, and I think I can rightly say that the 100% uh, we've achieved that. If you, if you take a look at the slide 30, you'll see that we've we've done uh, 3.7 million uh, year to date and achieved that 12%. I think before also a couple of quarters ago, we've we've always been pretty confident about delivering on that. So we've got another 3.4 to do um, in, in the balance of, of the year, and that's projected to get that 13%. So. That component is something that has been very strong. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mohit Agarwal of IIFL. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just one question. Uh, you know, just wanted to understand that how are uh, you know, are you seeing any changes in the new contracts that you are signing? You know, one observation that I had, and please correct me, uh, the whale, the weighted average uh, lease expiry on the new contracts seems to be shorter, and overall the portfolio whale has also come down. So uh, that and also any other changes that you are seeing in the newer contracts in the new leasing that uh, uh, you are entering into? Yeah, thanks, Mohit. So... Look, I think what, what's happening is in this particular period, corporate occupiers are, are in that assessment stage. They're figuring out, in the early days, it was figuring out how to um, continue their business. Um, now it's actually figuring out how to uh, continue to grow their business, grow their portfolio. How does that work with the de-densification and so on? So if there's one change that's coming uh, that's already there on the few leases that are being done is people are looking for a little more flexibility. So it's not about the rental rate. It, it might be about the term of the lease or a lock-in so that people can get past this uncertain phase and move to move back to, you know, a much more certain long-term view. So, and, and we, of course, where appropriate, we're showing some level of flexibility on aspects of those terms. 
to either attract or retain uh, tenants. But, you know, we, we're, we're very uh, confident of our position that demand will come back, vacancy will continue to be low in our markets and sub-markets, um, and, uh, and I think occupiers also are aware of that now, and that's another reason why you're really seeing rentals holding firm. Sure. Thanks. And uh, and apart from the lease expiry timelines, uh, any any changes on the the deposits? You know, in terms of uh, the the rent free period and the deposits that you get uh, from them. Any other changes there, or also on the the TI capex? Uh, any changes there to the new contracts? Hey, Mohit. Hi, Vikas here. That's a that's an interesting question. So, as Mike mentioned, uh, occupiers are definitely looking for flexibility. Uh, but in terms of deposits, in terms of other standard terms and escalations, etc., I think there has been no change. Uh, we have not seen any 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 change from what we have generally been uh, following and expecting. One interesting trend, of course, is occupiers with really high credit. Uh, occupiers of really high credit are also looking for the flexibility for the landowner, landlord, to fund the capex. And you know while uh, in general, we would not do that, but for really high quality occupiers with good balance sheets, we are open to that idea simply because it distinguishes us from some of the competition, given that we can finance this and the returns uh, on that, plus the fact that tenant uh, then is sticky as they grow in our parks, is a pretty neat outcome. So we are flexible on a case-by-case -case basis. We are, we are reviewing that. Uh, but in general, other than this, we have not seen any material change in the terms or the construct of the lease agreements. And, and just last clarification, Ad, you don't see any significant uh, material negative impact of that on our books, right? Uh, absolutely, no. Because, you know, one, we are not going to do this for every lease. We are very selective. But where if it's a global uh, renowned company or, you know, great balance sheet, and, uh, it, you know, while they can put in the capex, I think sometimes they just look for that flexibility and, you know, uh, given that the business has grown, but the, you know, the board has taken a call not to do any capital investment, that's the time where we can provide that flexibility, structuring and option that really distinguishes us. So it's, it's actually some of those cases with the guys who can really afford it, but the process will take more time given, uh, you know, the global, uh, you know, HQ mandate of, you know, freeze on capex. Sure. Thanks a lot and all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pulkit Patni from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot for taking my questions. I have a few of them. Uh, my first question is, uh, you know, uh, given that we've been in this uh, pandemic for more than six months now, uh, your conversations with various tenants, uh, is there a view of, uh, change in the way uh, uh, tenants look at various cities. So, you know, heavy exposure to Bangalore. Is it that you see tenants reducing and wanting to shift to a Hyderabad? Uh, so, so just to get a sense of where, you know, we could also look at more expansion. Uh, is is Bangalore considered to be sort of, you know, overly exposed to by technology companies given the nature of this pandemic? Uh, that would be my first question. So look, I, I, I think that the key issue is it, this is not, uh, you know, an either-or binary type of uh, conversation. Most of the large blue chip tenants uh, who are present in the market here would have one, two, or even more facilities in in different uh, cities. I could give I could give numerous examples. So, you know, the, the old model of it's, it's either City A or City B is, is really not, not valid. What, what it's all about, though, is that the tenants are coming to a market because of the talent in that particular sector in which they play. So, um, it, it, you, you are definitely seeing a cluster in, in, in Bangalore around the banking and finance sector, whereas five, seven years ago, you probably thought that that was, that was more focused around Bombay. Now it's both, but with a big cluster. Of course, the core technology operators might be in Hyderabad and 
uh, Bangalore, just, just like you've got, let's say, a Google and a Microsoft at present in both cities. So it's not really an either or, and I think in some respects that's the beauty of the, the business model that is, is India office. Um, is that there is great demand in, you know, we believe that the top six metros um, across the board. So it's, it's not either or. Um, the demand is there, and, and companies also, from a business continuity perspective, also might be present in one or two cities at a minimum. But, it, but but from an expansion perspective, uh, any particular city that has gotten more interesting post-COVID? Uh, so again, hi Rikasha. Again, depends on the occupier. What we could, what we would want to say is that Bangalore is a city which has a really large base and its preferred choice of growth by the existing occupiers, as we witnessed, like the quality. Hyderabad, on the other hand, while it has attracted a lot of top quality occupiers over the last one or two years has seen massive announcements around supply. Some of them definitely are going to be deferred, but really dense buildings, uh, you know, um, you know, really uh, tall 27, 30-floor buildings. I think occupiers are going to relook at those aspects, especially during this COVID time. So I think some of the supply, upcoming supply, especially in Hyderabad, is going to be impacted uh, due to the infrastructure and the density. Uh, again, as I said, it depends on the occupier. We do believe that Mumbai will be soft while our properties, all the three of our properties have done well because of the best access to the micro market. I think Mumbai is the one city which is going to see massive, uh, uh, massive rise in vacancy rates in general simply because the COVID pandemic has been more severe there and infrastructure is a bit limited. Uh, in, given the restrictions during the lockdown. What, what we do see, to add, to add to those comments from Vikash, is that the large corporate occupiers will generally cap the number of people that they would have in any one city. So, again, you could pick any one of the, the, the FANG um, type of technology companies or the, the banking sector. They, they, each one would have a headcount cap in a, in a particular city, and then any further growth tends to go to uh, another one of the top six um, tier one cities. But I don't, I, 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 you know, I don't think that, that the COVID response in itself is is driving occupiers to any one or other um, city. Sure, that's helpful. My second question is on the 1.2 million square feet uh, expiries in 2021, uh, where you mentioned that uh, some of them could be, uh, you know, COVID-induced um, expiries uh, or, or exits. Uh, could you could you highlight uh, uh, what exactly it means? Does it mean that these are occupiers? whose industry has been severely impacted by COVID and that's why they're exiting? Or does it mean that these are uh, tenants who are expecting a lower uh, mark to market? I mean, if you could uh, explain what exactly COVID-induced uh, uh, exit uh, are you referring to here? Sure, okay. Hi. Uh, Vikash, here again, this is an interesting question. So why don't I break that down? Uh, if you see slide 31 uh, of earnings deck, we did mention that approximately... Uh, 1.2 million square feet are likely exists, of which about 400 to 500,000 square feet are poet induced. So when we say that, we mean occupiers who are from sectors uh, which have been uh, significantly impacted and either their businesses have become outdated or cannot survive the pandemic, or they are looking at significantly lower cost, uh, given that you know uh, they would not have the ability to pay the kind of rent that we would be charging. To give you certain examples, in uh, uh, our MBC 247 Park in Mumbai, uh, an occupier occupying 29,000 square feet, uh, we encourage them to, uh, you know, uh, encourage them to look at another space because the business was an online retail uh, and physical furniture business, and that was obviously under stress. In MBC Golfings, we had 20,000 square feet a legacy occupier. Again, it was related to travel and travel bookings. Obviously, that business is completely. Uh, down right now. In Express Towers in Mumbai, we had a 6,000 square feet tenant, which was in the newspaper industry. Again, it's been extremely hard hit during the pandemic. Uh, in Embassy Golfings, again, we had a, a very small 
a player who was in the co-working industry again co-working industry is seeing a massive shake up with only the top 2 3 uh, players who have the balance sheet financing and size have, will survive and some of the others are facing it difficult you know so these are some of the examples and we've seen a lot of uh, such uh, cases whether it's retail uh, tenant supporting aviation industry newspaper with, uh, you know print industry whether it is uh, co-working these are the kind of occupiers legacy occupiers occupiers uh, whose businesses are not core technology who have faced the challenges during the pandemic who have uh, who have been uh, induced to exit due to the covid that, does that help yeah no that's helpful i remember in the previous presentation you had actually highlighted what percentage of the portfolio is occupied by them uh, so wh- what is fair to assume is that these people are exiting but there's no major renegotiation of rent downwards being done to sort of retain these these, these uh, occupiers yeah, that right? Is, right that is correct so in fact just to add to that while we say that 5.3% of our rents are from occupiers who are from these impacted industries in fact some of them are actually doing well and you know i will give you an example of a large online a large retail company in us whom we thought uh, would find it very difficult given their status in the us but they are in fact in india not only uh, paying rents paying escalations but also talking about more expansion in india simply because of the stress in the west they need to offshore more work to india so you know while they may be uh, five or six percent of the rents from the impacted sector some of these occupiers are actually uh, sustaining and coming out of the uh, the shock some of them obviously the business models are outdated and will will move out we from our perspective we take a pragmatic call on a case by case basis uh, to really the fundamental question we ask ourselves is is the business going to survive is this a growth tenant is this a tenant that is undertaking sophisticated top quality high up the value chain kind of services If the answer to all of these is yes, then that's the kind of tenant we want in our portfolio. If it is no, then uh, you know it's a, it, it, it's a, it's an issue simply because those are not the kind of tenants who will grow and pay those premium rents that we want. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amandeep Singh from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. So my first question is regarding the acquisition of property management services business for MBC Manya and Tech Zone. So on page 92 of the valuation summary, we note that there is sharp increase in net margin estimates over FY 23 to 27. So in that context, is it fair to say that that is due to completion of upcoming assets at both the properties, and you expect the entire lease up at Manya and Tech Zone by FY 26, 27 respectively? Hey, Mandeep, hi. This is Vikash here. That is correct. so uh, while I, i i'm still referring to the page number on the valuation report that you mentioned but uh, you know th- that is the valuation report factors the future and the construction and the margins on those both for both the assets but let me take a step back right and get, uh, lay out our thoughts of the property management operations that we have acquired one this relates to assets which we currently already own in the reed and this acquisition fully integrates the prop- park management and uh, improves the customer service and enhances uh, occupy connect second uh, while we have acquired it for 4740 million rupees uh, and it's been an 8.5% discount really the way to look at it is the expected pro forma annual ebitda for this purchase is about 415 million rupees and you know that translates given the way we have financed it through the 6.7% coupon bond it translates into dpu accretion of 0.5% day one post acquisition so honestly for us this acquisition was strategic uh, and while uh, the valuers have used the dcf method we look at it in terms of what's the pro forma one year forward ebitda that we have uh, that we would be uh, assuming and uh, what does that mean to our dpu day one does that does it help yes that that's really helpful and secondly as far as vacancy at mumbai property star and msc 247 so we have also seen tenants vacating ahead of expiry in these micro markets so in that context can you help us understand the trend post september and how are the rentals impacted here yeah sure so in in 247 specifically you know the the, the example that you referred to we had a large 
a retail company again who was occupying office premises and who has been significantly impacted by the covid pandemic the entire business model so that's why you see some we can see uh, you know uh, increase in that asset uh, in general i would say all the three of our mumbai assets have uh, you know withstood pretty well during the pandemic we we do note in general that the mumbai market uh, especially some of the downtown buildings has seen significant churn and expiry simply because these are focused towards domestic occupiers uh, and the rental levels are uh different than what we have in some of the growth cities like bangalore and hyderabad so that's point number 1 two of course uh the pandemic and the restrictions that that's been placed in mumbai uh makes it a little easier for the domestic occupiers to take a call on uh you know uh, you know ex- you know extending the work from home for certain time period and you know mumbai the switching costs in mumbai are not uh that high as in other locations given the proportion of rent versus uh fit out of furniture costs so that overall mumbai market has uh, seen a lot of churn however i think whatever we have seen in our portfolio we, are, we have done couple of renewals recently uh in express towers and in fifc with top notch technology companies uh you know into uh, including the names that you will see on slide number 1 and right? in the name that you will see on slide number 17 uh you know uh, so we think uh, uh that the outlook for our property is is stable and uh, you know we don't see any significant reduction in rentals for our property but the market mumbai market remains challenging so sure, thanks for this that's all from my side and all the best thank you thank you thank you the next question is from the line of kunal sayal from bank of america please go ahead so yeah, thank you a couple of questions from my side uh, the first one is um, you know mike i found the comment very interesting that some of your lease signings this quarter are above market rates so broadly wanted to understand is that a reflection of the quality of uh, your spaces on offer or should we think of it as um, a very strong pricing discipline in the market that's question number 1 and then the second one again going back to your initial comments of demand revival potentially in two quarters um do you think pent up demand is sort of alone um you know a, a strong factor to drive this or will it have to be accompanied by let's say some of the international um occupiers having at least 30 or 40% of their existing space um getting occupied thanks I I'm not clear on the on the second question sorry Kunal thank you could you just clarify sure uh, I mean I'm just wondering yes I was wondering if um customers as they sign up for new spaces would they necessarily need to see the existing occupancy levels of uh, of the current lease portfolio go above a certain critical percentage uh you mean in terms of, okay so it's about to work will will the slow back to work essentially dampen the acceleration of take up of new space right Absolutely. i think yes yeah okay so look i think your comment about above above market rate uh when the vcas mentioned that it is about pricing discipline um we we have been not just during this pandemic but uh but even prior but we have been disciplined about pricing against our product we will try to be flexible in a number of different customer centric ways um and we look for ways that we we can um make the overall product proposition appealing so it may be about um you, you know the, the the complete ecosystem so for example by building a conferencing center alongside NXT we think that that gives us a competitive edge against other products in the market and so that's an element where we are able to achieve those those premium rentals and we are disciplined uh, about that you know at the moment um when the market is so muted in terms of leasing there there's really no uh no sense in looking at price reductions 
uh, when when there's there's so little going on in the way of transactions. So I think we'll be right in that, and we'll be proven right come the next financial year. Um, in terms of demand um, being linked to the back-to-work uh, proportion, to a certain extent, I think that is true. Yes, for the smaller um, occupiers, that it will they will wait until they get back to a level that they're confident and that they're stable. Um, but for the large corporate occupiers who are looking at long-term consolidations, um, I, I think those types of occupiers who, who are looking for large spaces um, will certainly, they, they have to move ahead. They are thinking longer term. They know that their businesses are growing, that their headcounts are growing. And one of the numerous advantages that we have is we're able to offer that flex and runway for that growth trajectory for those occupiers. So we have, I, I would say, literally dozens of occupiers who over the last six or seven years, as we've leased up small spaces, they've grown with us. Um, the, the most extreme example is, is, is that U.S. Uh, retail company that started with three people in 2014 and is now nearly 3,000 people. But by offering that flexibility, we're able to um, bring that tenant on board, build a relationship, and they grow with us over many years to come. So, yes, I think to, to both of your questions, the answer is yes. Pricing discipline um, and demand linked to that back-to-work uh, um, of employees. Thank you. We'll be able to take one last question. We take the last question from the line of Rakesh Vyas from HDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. I have a couple of questions, actually. First one, just wanted to get some sense. As the workforce is coming back uh, uh, to offices, although it remains significantly below what it has been peak, but have we seen any discussion around uh, change in office layout uh, pertaining to de-densification, etc., already, or, or it's it's under discussion uh, to some extent. Yeah, I mean we've heard we've heard um, of a few conversations about it. Have we have we seen anybody actually execute on that? No, but we are seeing new tenants who are looking at spaces with less dense space standards. Again, I think the companies are still in that assessment. Um, they want to get past this stage when they can get back to to the office, and then on new space, certainly, you'll see a higher standard and a, and a, a reduced density. Yeah. Also, just to add, uh, the existing occupiers, uh, they have adopted, in the short term, they are, they are, they are open to and they are uh, uh, determining the option, uh, optionality of just remodeling the existing space. Long term, for the long term, existing occupiers approach has been to just wait, and as Mike said, assess. And I guess uh, as the pandemic unfolds, they will take more medium term use. So I think that's how the existing occupiers are looking at it. Sure. And my second question uh, is uh, uh, just wanted to understand what is the total amount of lease expiry in next 12 months? And I have a related question there with that as well. So, uh, hi, again, Vikash here. So, roughly to take a guess, uh, you know, we have the financial year numbers, but uh, we have about uh, 1.2 million square feet of expiries this year. And if you were to take the half, uh, the first half of next year, it would be about 500,000 square feet. So, roughly, Rakesh, we have about 1.7 million square feet of lease expiries in NTM. Got it. I just wanted to understand on that aspect itself. So, given how the work from home commentary is still moving around, uh, Mike also talked about some sort of hybrid working environment in general by uh, various companies. Uh, is there a risk incrementally from here on that the lease renewals on some of these which are coming up in next 12 months, not only for us, for, but for industry as a whole, uh, could probably see more pressure in terms of releasing and therefore increases vacancy and put pressure on rentals. Your thoughts around that? Yeah, thanks. That's an interesting question. So, certainly that would be the case for grade B premises. Uh, you know, the legacy buildings or buildings were not compliant, safety, health, 
and wellness. And what we are seeing is a couple of things. Uh, one, most companies are paying less than the market, which is true for our portfolio, especially, but also for top quality, uh, you know, buildings across the country. So it's important to note that the switching costs for occupiers is pretty high, uh, especially, uh, you know, given the fact that all the capex expense has been incurred by them uh, already uh, when they uh, when they occupy the premises, plus uh, to factor in all the reworking of the transport planning and costs associated with the employee movement. Third, the availability of gray area office space is pretty limited, especially in our old markets of Bangalore and Pune. So what happens is if they would want to relocate, uh, you know, uh, you know, they they need uh, another space. And, uh, you know, that, that, that space needs to be available. Plus, the fact that they're already below market here, you know, you know, it would make more sense for them to renew or take up space at the existing premises. Uh, fourth is because of the liquidity free, uh, freeze and also the labor challenges, we believe that supply will be really constrained in the next two to three years. So, if you see all of these factors, occupiers who are, whose business is actually fundamentally doing well, they really would need office space, and the gray area office premises is the place uh, where they will opt. And again, rent is really not a factor for most of our occupiers, especially simply because they are here for the talent and for the quality of the space. Thank you very much. We'll take that as the last question. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Mike Holland, CEO, MBC Reed, for closing comments. Great, thank you. And, and sincerely to all of you who asked questions, thank you very much. Great uh, discussion. I hope that we've communicated that despite these extraordinary times brought about by the pandemic, we've delivered a resilient set of results this quarter, which take our year-to-date distributions to 874 crores. Um, I believe and hope that we'll soon pass the worst uh, of the pandemic here in India and its impact on economic activity. Um, and that we will see a strong revival in the leasing market in India thereafter. But until then, I believe that our robust balance sheet, strong occupier relationships, and our committed on-the-ground teams, we're very well positioned to navigate the headwinds that have been brought by the pandemic and emerge uh, stronger. We are very grateful to you for your interest in the REIT and for your time today. So thank you and good evening. Thank you very much. On behalf of Embassy Office Park Street, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. You may now disconnect your lines.